All right, as we are continuing to prepare our hearts to receive God's word as this morning, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight. Lord, you are our rock and you are our redeemer. And all of God's people together said, Amen. Amen. All right, friends of Christ, we have been uh, talking about something all throughout the season of Lent. Last week I asked you what it was and I got crickets. And I told you, I was going to ask you again this week, what have we been talking about? What have we been talking about throughout Lent? Hey, much better. You learned your lesson. I like it. We have been talking about forgiveness. Uh, kiddos, if you got one of those sermon note sheets, uh, if you're wondering what my key word for today is, it's forgiveness. Forgiveness or forgive. Okay, either one of those two. Uh, and they, uh, when I told them my keyword last time, they counted very carefully how many times I said it. So I'm going to be a little more careful this morning. Uh, how often I say this, but kids, that's the word you can listen for this morning, is forgiveness. Uh, a couple of weeks ago when we started this, we talked about where forgiveness starts. It starts in the heart of God. Right? We talked about that as being the source waters of forgiveness. And we saw how, uh, how it flows from a heart of God that is compassionate and gracious. In the last week, we looked at some of the unique characteristics of God's forgiveness. And we, we got a little bit more of a, a bigger picture of what it looks like in our lives for us to receive it. Uh, and in some ways, it would be really nice if we could just kind of stop right there, right? Uh, it'd be super great if we could just kind of learn about God's forgiveness, uh, kind of revel in the glory of it, uh, and then just leave it at that. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be kind of a nice feel good way to spend Lent, it would make us, make us really happy uh, to be forgiven by God. Uh, but there's something that continually comes up as you read scripture. There's a specific instruction around forgiveness that we get over and over and over again. Uh, and it means that we can't stop our series quite yet. We need to keep uh, discovering together what scripture is telling us uh, on how we forgive and how we are forgiven. Uh, so this morning I want you to uh, look at the book of Colossians, please. We're going to look at Colossians chapter 3. I'm just going to be reading a couple of verses. Uh, Colossians is in the New Testament. Uh, it's, an, it's an epistle, which means it's a letter uh, that the Apostle Paul wrote to a community of Christians. Uh, and these letters were uh, kind of their, their way of, of learning what it looks like to follow Jesus. Uh, Christianity was very new. Following Jesus was very new. They didn't have a Bible like this to read. They didn't have a long history of, of Christianity to draw from. Uh, so these letters were kind of like a lifeline for them. Uh, and in these letters, Paul covered all sorts of different topics. He covered theology, uh, but he also did a lot of, uh, hey, this is what it looks like for you to live together as Christians. This is the way you should treat each other. This is, these are the things that you should be known and identified by. So this, these verses that we're going to read today are in one of those sections. Paul is giving some instructions about what it looks like to live in community together. Uh, so Colossians chapter 3, I'm going to start reading at verse 12 uh, and just read through verse 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. People of God, this is the word of the Lord. You see why we can't stop our series just talking about God's forgiveness? Paul calls the Colossians, and he calls us today not just to receive forgiveness from God, but to pass it on to others. He says, bear with each other. That's hard enough as it is sometimes, right? Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. It doesn't get much clearer than that, right? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. 
What we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks, this forgiveness that flows from a heart of compassion, all of those five unique characteristics about it that we saw last week, that's the kind of forgiveness God is calling us to pass on to others. That's the kind of heart God is calling us to have. We can't only be recipients of God's forgiveness. We have to be agents of it in the world as well. Now, uh, it, we talk about this a lot, and, and you, you've probably heard before that you're supposed to forgive each other, but we don't have to talk about what it looks like. So I want to do a couple things this morning. I want to get kind of specific with you this morning about this command that we get here in the book of Colossians. I want to do two things. I want to first walk you through uh, what I'm going to call the three movements of forgiveness. Okay, we're going to talk about three movements of forgiveness, and then after we talk about those movements, uh, I'm going to have just a few brief items to remember when you're forgiving somebody else. Okay? Because you can see where I'm going with this. I'm going to ask you to actually start forgiving other people in your life. That's where we're headed with this. Okay? We're going to talk about the three movements of forgiveness, and then just a few brief things to remember while you're forgiving. Uh, and so first, I, I want to lay out this process, these three movements of forgiveness. And before I get into this, I should tell you uh, that a lot of these three movements and stuff I'm talking about this morning uh, comes from this book. I don't want you to think I'm really smart, like I want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, it's called The Art of Forgiving. Uh, it's written by a guy named Louis Smedes. Uh, he's a reformed thinker and theologian, and he writes a lot on forgiveness. This isn't his only book on forgiveness, but uh, if you would want to know more or learn more, you can come and borrow these books from me. They're great uh, kind of resources for it. So a lot of what I'm talking about today is coming from, uh, from Lou Smeads, and I'm going to kind of try and unpack some of it for us. But he talks about, uh, he calls them stages. I like movements a little better. Three movements of forgiveness. When somebody hurts you, when somebody wrongs you, when somebody hurts uh, not only you, but somebody, maybe somebody that you love, Right? When you're blaming somebody for something, what do you actually have to do to forgive them? What does it look like? Uh, I think oftentimes we think of forgiving as just trying not to be mad anymore. Right? Uh, there's a little bit more to it than that. So I want to talk through the three movements of forgiveness. The first one is this. We rediscover the humanity of the person who hurt us. It's the first movement in forgiveness. Uh, when somebody hurts us, when somebody hurts a family member, spouse, or children, or parents, uh, when somebody hurts a close friend or somebody that we love, oftentimes what we will do uh, is we will turn that person, not into a person, but we'll reduce that person to that one action that they took. Okay? So I'm going to use Julian as an example, because Julian's right here this morning. Let's say Julian calls me a very, very mean name. No, he hasn't done this ever before, okay? It's just an example. Let's say Julian calls me a very, very mean name, and it hurts me, and it upsets me. When I think of Julian in my brain then, I don't think of him as, as Julian, as child of God, as image bearer of God. I think of him as, hey, he's the name caller. He's mean. He's nasty. He's, he's whatever, right? You fill in the blank. And so I reduce him to not who he is as a child of God, as a person. I reduce him to this one thing that he has done, to this mistake that he has made. I think you can see this if you look at your own life, if you think of people who might have hurt you. What we start to do is we start to put labels on them, and we start to reduce them to the actions that they have taken. And so the first movement in forgiveness is to rediscover that the person who hurt you is a human being, is an image bearer of God, it's a person just like you, who is capable of doing wonderful things and terrible things. A person capable of speaking lies, a person capable of speaking the truth, a person who has been forgiven by God, a person who is loved by God, a person who bears the image of Christ on their very being. Our first movement in forgiveness is to remember that the person who hurt us is a human being. And I want to share with you a quote that Smeets has about this. I love this. Don't worry about writing all this down. Just get the gist of it. He writes this. Forgiving our enemy doesn't turn them into a close friend or a promising husband or a trustworthy partner. We do not diminish the wrongness of what he did to us. We do not blind ourselves to the reality that he's perfectly capable of doing it again. But 
we take him back into our private world as a person who shares our faulty humanity, bruised like us, faulty like us, still thoroughly blamable for what he did to us, yet human like us. Our first movement in forgiveness is rediscovering that the people who hurt us are human beings, capable of good and bad, just like us. And that leads us to the second movement. The second movement in forgiveness is we surrender our right to get even. We lay down our right for vengeance. Uh, our first instinct when somebody hurts us is to hurt them back. If, if Julian would call me a mean name, my first instinct would be to call him a mean name back. Right? An eye for an eye. Uh, if somebody hurts me, I deserve to hurt them. Uh, I, I think we can even think of this uh, in, in, in terms of uh, when somebody hurts somebody that we love. Right? If somebody said something mean about Amy, I would probably be way more upset than if they said something mean about me. Right? Uh, but what happens in the second movement of forgiveness is we surrender our right to get even. All of that, that want and desire that would well up in you to say, I have to get back at this person. I have, to, I have to get back at them some way, somehow. I have to break them down just like they broke me down. Uh, we give it up and we surrender it. Remember last week when we talked about God's forgiveness being costly? Costly for God. It cost God something to give us forgiveness. This is the price that we pay when we forgive others. We surrender our right to get even. We lay down our need for vengeance. Uh, we lay down our right to hold a grudge. We lay down our right to speak poorly of someone. We lay down our right to hurt them back. Uh, and this is the movement in forgiveness that I think is probably the most challenging. Uh, surrendering your right to get even. Because it feels like they're getting away with something, right? It feels like somebody is getting something that they don't deserve. It feels like they're receiving this blessing and this gift that, that even though they haven't earned it, and even though they don't deserve it, they're receiving it anyway. Friends of Christ, does that sound familiar? Does that sound like grace to you? Does that sound like what we have been given, that even though we haven't earned it, even though we don't deserve it, we have a gift of forgiveness that's been given and poured out to us? And didn't the Apostle Paul just ask us to forgive if the Lord forgave you? It's going to cost you something when you forgive somebody. You have to surrender and lay down your right to get even. And this leads us to the third movement of forgiveness. We revise our feelings towards the person that we forgive. When we uh, remember that they're a person, and we surrender and we lay down this, this need for vengeance, this right to get even. What starts to happen to us is our feelings towards that person start to be revised. Instead of being filled with, with anger or hatred or, or secretly kind of wishing bad things for that person, uh, we start to love them as God loves them. We start to wish good things for their life. We start to want to support them uh, and look to their good rather than look to their harm. Uh, we start to actually uh, support and love another person as Christ calls us to do. Uh, and these feelings initially might be very, very small. <laughs> right? If somebody's hurt you, or somebody's hurt somebody that you loved, uh, and you've kind of done these things, your, your feelings of, of good and love towards them might be very, very tiny at first. That's fine. Okay? That's just fine. Uh, but what happens as you continue this process is those feelings start to grow. As you surrender that right to get even, uh, the way that you feel about those people or that person uh, will slowly start to change. You will see the image of Christ in them and you will start to rejoice when they rejoice. You will start to hurt when they hurt, rather than uh, seeing them get hurt and kind of secretly smiling to yourself and saying, ha, well, that's kind of nice. Uh, or, hey, that worked out well, even though I didn't have to do that. Right? We will rejoice with others when they rejoice, and we will hurt with others when they hurt. These are the three kind of basic movements of forgiveness. Uh, we rediscover that people are human beings, uh, capable of good and bad. We surrender and lay down our right to get even. 
uh, and we slowly revise our feelings towards the person that we forgive. Uh, and this sounds pretty simple on paper, right? Or on screen, right? Three movements, three steps to go through. I know you like tangible things, but friends in Christ, I gotta tell you, this is hard work, okay? There's a reason uh, that we're saying that it's costly, because this is going to cost you something. It's going to cost you uh, that anger and that hatred that you like to hold on to, that you nourish in different ways. You're going to have to lay that down. Uh, and we're going to dive into these a little bit more specifically over the coming weeks. I'm just trying to kind of give us an overview today. Uh, but these are the three movements of forgiveness. Uh, and we're going to see next week specifically uh, how God goes through these three movements when God forgives us. We're going to look at a story in the Bible and say, hey, hey, how do we see these three movements being played out in this story? Uh, and so I want to encourage you this week uh, to think about these movements. And to think about, all right, how can I start to forgive somebody else in my life? As we come to, to kind of the closing here, I told you I wanted to not only lay out these three movements so we can forgive as the Lord forgave us, but I also want to give you some, just some brief things to remember as you're starting the process of forgiving somebody this week. Just, just a few brief things here, okay? Forgiveness is not a cure-all for all of our pain. You forgive somebody when they have done something to hurt you, right? We all carry all sorts of pain and sorrow with us. But a lot of pain and a lot of sorrow in our lives needs to be grieved or needs to be lamented. And that's something different, okay? You don't forgive somebody for, uh, for passing away, right? You might have anger towards that person. You might be filled with sorrow uh, in, in their loss, but that's not forgiveness, okay? That, that's a different process that we're talking about. So I don't want you to look at those three movements and say, all right, if I just do that, all of my pain and all of my sorrow will be gone. Okay, we're talking about a specific item here. We're talking about forgiveness. It goes towards a person. Uh, we forgive people for what they do, not who they are. Right? You forgive somebody for a specific action that they did to hurt you or hurt somebody that you love. You don't forgive somebody for just generally being a person that you don't like. <laughs> right? If you have someone in your life where you're like, I just don't like that person. That person annoys me or frustrates me. That's not something to forgive them for, okay? That's just something else you got to work through. It's a different process, okay? We forgive people for what they do, for specific actions that they did to hurt you or hurt somebody that you love. This is a big one. Forgiveness doesn't require a request or reconciliation, okay? If Julian would call me a bad name, uh, I, I wouldn't have to wait for him to come to me and say, you know what? Uh, Marcus, I'd like your forgiveness for that. I don't have to wait for that before I can go through this process in my own heart. Uh, to forgive somebody else doesn't mean that they have to request it from you. Forgiveness is kind of a, it's a one-person show when you're talking about forgiveness from, from one person to another. It's something that you do in your own heart. Uh, it also doesn't require reconciliation. Right? It doesn't mean that you and this person that hurt you are going to be best friends forevermore, amen and amen. Okay? And that's fine. Reconciliation takes two people. And that's something different. That's a different process. Okay? Reconciliation is helped when there has been forgiveness on the individual part. But we're talking about something different. Okay? When we're talking about forgiveness, these three movements, we're talking about forgiving somebody who has done something to hurt you. And that's what these three movements are for. And lastly, forgiving doesn't mean forgetting. Maybe you've heard that before, right? Forgive and forget. Uh, but we as human beings are terrible at that. <laughs> we just are, right? We don't forget. If, if somebody does something to hurt you or hurt somebody that you love, you can't just forget about it. And so what you have to do then is you have to forgive over and over again. We saw last week how the forgiveness of God was repetitive. Right? How, how God offers it to us over and over again. I'm going to go back to Julian. Julian would call me a name. Uh, I'm really sorry, Julian, uh, but you're just right there. Uh, if Julian would do this to me, uh, and if I moved through the process of forgiving him, and if, I, and if I really truly feel like I've come to a place where I've forgiven Julian, but then maybe six months later, something else happens, and all of a sudden I remember what Julian said. I remember that pain. I remember that hurt, and I'm angry at him all over again. Well, that's going to happen. He's not a human being, right? So all that means is that I start the process over again. 
I rediscover that he's a person, and I remember he makes mistakes. I surrender and lay down my right to get even with him, and I, I begin to revise my feelings towards him. This isn't like a one-time, linear thing. Forgiveness is something you come back to over and over and over again. Sometimes you have to forgive one person for the same thing over and over and over again. Forgiveness is tough, but the call on our lives remains clear. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. We're going to come to the table in just a few moments. Uh, and when we come to the table, we remember the cost that God has paid to secure our forgiveness, to secure our life. We remember uh, that Jesus came into this world. He, he gave up all the glory that he had with the Father and the Spirit, right? He gave that all up and he took on our flesh. And he walked among us and he was forgotten and mocked and he was pushed aside. Uh, and he eventually gave his life for us so that we might be forgiven, so that we might be found right with God. And he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and now he reigns at the right hand of God the Father for us. So as you come to the table in a few moments, uh, we're first going to uh, we're first going to confess, uh, confess and lay down our sins before the Lord. But as you come to the table, I want you to have a couple of things in your mind. I want you first and foremost to be thinking uh, about the forgiveness that you have received from Christ. About the price that Jesus was willing to pay. About what Jesus gave up instead of giving even what he laid down so that we might have life with him again. I want you to think about how thankful you are and how great the cost is that Jesus paid. And then I want you to start thinking about what it looks like for you in your life to forgive others. When we come to the table, we don't come as individuals. We all come to, to eat from the same loaf and drink from the same cup. We gather as brothers and sisters in Christ, a family in Christ. It's Family Sunday, right? We name that and we claim that. So if there's something that you're holding on to in your heart, if there's revenge you are wanting to take, if there's a grudge that you are holding on to and, and wanting to nurse and, and keep to yourself, I'd invite you as you receive communion to think about what it looks like to lay that down. Think about what it looks like to remember that that person is a human being, to surrender your right to get even, and to ask the Spirit to work in you so that your feelings can be revised towards that person. Because if Jesus can give up his life for us, certainly we can give up that for one another. Amen?